All right, everyone. I want to respect your time. I'm sure people will be kind of filtering in as we get started, but uh, I'm going to go ahead and say welcome all of you to tonight's webinar, Loving Nature and Fighting for It, A Natural History of Acid Rain, uh, featuring Dr. Jean Likens, whom I will introduce more fully in a moment. Uh, so my name is Jesse Rack. I'm the program director at the Natural History Institute here in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, I first wanted to say a couple of words about the Institute for those of you who are not familiar with our work. So the Natural History Institute or NHI is a mission-based independent nonprofit uh, based here in Prescott, Arizona. Uh, our mission is to provide leadership and resources for a revitalized practice of natural history that integrates art, sciences, and the humanities. Um, we believe that everyone can participate in the practice of natural history, and that by so doing, they can learn to care for the world and in return, reap the benefits, both physical and mental health benefits of, of nature. Um, I wanna bring your attention to a couple of resources that the Institute has to offer. One is our website. So that's just naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Uh, has all sorts of information on there, including about upcoming programs. All of our in-person in talks, for those of you not from Arizona, all of our in-person talks are live streamed simultaneously, and we always have them all on our website to watch or on our YouTube to watch afterward. Um, so coming up next, we have on December 1st, I'll actually be giving a talk. I'm not just the program director, I'm also a herpetologist. So I'll be giving a talk about amphibians and reptiles in Arizona. Um, in addition, we have the rest of this science and communication uh, webinar series. And this whole series is featuring conversations with scientists talking about the natural history behind their work. And so over the course of this series, we're gonna cover sunflowers, pikas, conservation education, hummingbirds, and climate change. So stay tuned, uh, all of that is very exciting. It's gonna be a lot of fun. I also wanted to say quickly, if you are so inclined as to consider supporting the work of NHI, like all small, small nonprofits, this is a labor of love and your support is so important and necessary and we deeply appreciate anything you can do. Um, on that website, the homepage of the website, you can donate if that's something you feel inclined to do, but no big deal, we have free stuff too. Um, so a couple of things about the logistics of the program tonight in terms of Zoom protocol. Uh, a lot of people have been saying hello through the chat function. I love that. Um, but just so you know, I'm going to be turning the chat off when I'm done introducing Jean, just because we find it's kind of distracting to have it going off during the talk. Um, however, uh, in its place, we will be using the Q&A function here at the bottom, which I see folks have already found. Um, so it's a little icon that looks like a cartoon speech bubble. And so anytime it'll be on throughout the whole program, if at any time you have a question for Jean or a comment you'd like to make, feel free to, uh, to put that in there. We're gonna save the last 10 minutes and, and visit your questions. Um, along the same lines, if you see someone else ask a question that you were gonna ask or you know something that you agree with, there's a little thumbs up icon. So you can kind of upvote that and we'll see the ones that the most people wanna ask. Um, finally, this program will be recorded and available on the Natural History Institute's YouTube channel tomorrow. I'm going to trim off the beginning uh, where everyone is coming in and it'll get right to the good stuff. So check that out. Feel free to share uh, if you want to, uh, if you're so inspired. Um, so now, with all of that out of the way, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our guest here tonight, Dr. Jean Likens. Um, so, Dr. Likens is an ecologist best known for co-discovering acid rain in North America and identifying fossil fuel combustion as the cause of increasing precipitation acidity. And this work has influenced governmental policy, particularly the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. Um, he co-founded the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study at the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest in New Hampshire. He founded the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies in Millbrook, New York. Um, Jean currently holds faculty positions at Cornell, Yale, Rutgers, SUNY Albany, and UConn. Uh, he's been an advisor to two governors in New York State and one in New Hampshire, as well as one U.S. president. Uh, Dr. Likens is the author, co-author, or editor of 26 books and more than 600 scientific papers. He has 11 honorary doctorate degrees, the only person I've ever even heard of with a 117-page CV. Uh, it's a truly incredible person, and I'm so grateful to be here with you tonight. So thank you so much, Gene, for joining us. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you, Jesse, for that kind introduction. I'm very pleased to, to be here. Um, this is kind of a new uh, event for me. I've never done one quite like this before, but with you in charge, I feel very confident that uh, you will handle uh, all the, the, the details very well. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's very kind of you to say I only have one doctorate and it's not even honorary. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm going to do my best. Um, so to kind of kick off our conversation, I'm going to kind of get you started with something close to our hearts here at the Institute. Um, I want to know, and I know we're going to get to the science, don't worry, scientists in the audience, but how do you define natural history and where do you see it in your work? Uh, well, I would define natural history as uh, a combination of curiosity and observation. Um, when I uh, approach an area that um, is of interest to me, say I walk into a forest, uh, I want to know how many plants and animals and uh, maybe microbes are there. Uh, and I want to know something about uh, what they're doing um, because that turns out not only to be really interesting to me um, and always has been, but it turns out to be very important in terms of providing a baseline for uh, any more formal science that I'd like to do, such as experimentation or whatever. I need to know what's there. So I want to know how the world works and I want to know what the world is made up of. Um, and so that's. Uh, uh, that's the way I would define, uh, it's a long definition, but that's the way I would define natural history. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I suppose one of the premier natural historians uh, um, was uh, some of our early explorers, uh, people that uh, ventured into areas that, that no one uh, had been before other than maybe indigenous people. And so, um, they wanted what was there and how did it work? And that's what interests me as well. I love that that's kind of curiosity and question driven and just guided by just your wonder about the world. Uh, I think that aligns very much. We actually do have a formal definition of natural history here, which I'm gonna share with you. Uh, so we we say that natural history is a practice. So, and that's very important that it's, it's something you do, right? So it's a practice of intentional focus, uh, attentiveness and receptivity to the more than human world guided by honesty and accuracy. And I think that that has a lot to say to kind of a, a science definition of natural history as well. It's because at its heart, it's all kind of just like, we just want to know about the world. We just are curious. Maybe. Yeah, that's a nice definition. Uh, my first academic job was um, as a professor at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire and um, routinely to um, other professors, they were both botanists and I, on Thursday afternoon, we would go out into the field somewhere. We'd go to a, a forest plot or a, a lake or whatever. And we would say, well, okay, well, how does this work? What's here? How, how did this jack pine uh, plantation get here? And so we, we thought we were playing detective and it was very, very influential for me as a young uh, academic starting uh, my career. Uh, they were very wise and knew a lot about uh, the natural world. I learned from them and I hope they learned a little from me, but it was very important to me. I love that that's just like the, the wonder and the mystery of nature just leading you to, to science. I think that's great. Um, that actually kind of leads me into my question because I kind of want to focus this more on you. We came here to listen to you. Um, I would love for you to, to kind of trace, and you, you, you hinted at it with that story a little bit, but maybe trace a little of your personal pathway to becoming a scientist, maybe the path of you, if I can go be so bold, falling in love with the world. <laughs> well, I fell, I fell in love with the world early. Well, I grew up on a, a small farm in the Midwest, and so from a very young age, I was out uh, in, the, in the, the field, if you will. I was, I was uh, mostly barefoot in the, the summertime. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was mostly barefoot in the summertime, but I was wandering around 
uh, the forests and, and I happen to be in a lake district. Uh, and so there are lots of lakes uh, and water around me. So that attracted me very much. And not only the, the plants, but the animals and the, and the conditions. So if there was a lake, uh, I was way too young, but I, to, to know, but I wondered, well, how did that lake get there? What, what, what uh, and I didn't know the answer to that. It was only much, much later when I uh, knew about the origin of lakes that I knew something about how the, those lakes in that area were formed. But um, that, that really uh, hooked me because um, it was just so exciting to, to uh, you know, kind of come around a corner or come around a big tree and on the other side see something that I didn't expect. Uh, and that excitement, that thrill of uh, what nature was showing me, was providing me, was something that has been with me my entire life. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so I had, I had a similar kind of experience, except I was like, are there any frogs in there? That was yeah, there. Right. <laughs> how you become a herpetologist. Um, so, <laughs> so, okay, we heard from my intro that uh, you and your colleagues discovered acid rain in North America. So I would love if you are willing to kind of tell us the story of how this came about. And al along the way, I'm sure you'll cover this, but just for, um, you know, people of all backgrounds are watching tonight. So. Uh, what what is acid rain and why is it bad? I you know so yeah well um, um, so my first job as I said was at Dartmouth College and and it was from there that I was very fortunate. My whole life has been controlled by serendipity and I define serendipity as keeping your eyes, ears, and mind open and if something interesting appears, you jump on it and try to understand it and, and run with it. Uh, and that's what happened to me. I, I moved to Dartmouth College and I uh, learned that Hubbard Brook was uh, relatively close by, about an hour uh, and a half drive away or so. And um, so with colleagues, we started the Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study. And to do that, we wanted to try to measure all the inputs to the system and all the outputs from the system. And the outputs would be primarily those in the drainage water. And our metaphor was, could we use um, the chemistry of stream water, much like a physician would use the chemistry of blood and urine to measure the health of the patient. And if something changed in your blood and urine chemistry, then there must be something wrong inside. So you have to go in and look at the lungs and the kidneys and the whatever to try to find out why. Well, we're using that metaphor to try to understand this very, very complicated landscape that we were starting to tackle. Well, so the first thing we needed to do was, was collect some samples of rain and see what its chemistry was like. We didn't know. So in uh, July of 1963, the very first sample of rain that I collected, it was about 100 times more acidic than we thought it should be. But we really didn't know how acidic it should be because there wasn't any uh, reference that we could compare with. It just seemed So weird. that just raised all kinds of questions. Was this something unique to uh, the White Mountains of New Hampshire where Hubbard mm -hmm. Brook was? Or uh, how long had it been that way? Uh, did it cause any ecological effects? Um, uh, what was causing it, uh, all those sort of fundamental questions that we had to answer in order to uh, understand what that first sample meant. Right. We continued to make measurements of um, the chemistry of rain and we found that it continued to be in all of our samples, very acidic. And um, uh, so that led to, uh, I suppose, almost a whole lifetime of work and trying to answer those questions. I'll give you one quick example. Um, there are many examples I can give you, depending on how much time you want to listen to my stories, but- <laughs> All night, we've got all night. <laughs> <laughs> but but one, one of the questions as I said is, is um, was this unusual? And, and what, what would a background sample be? So, we went to um, uh, some of the most remote places on the planet. We went to the southern part of Chile, 
we, the Torres del Paine area. We went to the southern tip of Africa, went to an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, Amsterdam Island, it's called. It takes a month by ship to get there because there's no landing strip, or there wasn't then, on mm -hmm. Amsterdam Island. Uh, we went to a remote place of Australia, a remote place in China, and we set up collection stations in all those locations and measured the chemistry of rain. There was rain in all of them, no snow in them, and, um, and ran them uh, in most cases for up to 10 years in order to get one number. And that number was what is the pH of rain in those remote areas relatively isolated from human activity. Uh, so that was our background. 10 years at all those sites to get one number. The number turned out to be a pH of 5.1. Um, that was a surprise to us, but then that was our reference number that uh, we've used uh, to uh, provide a baseline for uh, how different the, the number at Hubbard Brook was. So just to jump, time. oh, sorry, just to jump in really quickly, I wanted to kind of touch base seven is the middle of the pH scale, right? And then higher numbers mean it's basic and lower numbers mean it's more acidic, right? Thank you for clarifying that. Yes, that's right. So, and there's a tenfold difference between every number. So a pH of four is 10 times more acidic than a pH of five. Okay. A pH of three is a hundred times more acidic than a pH of five. Okay. So when I said that it was about a hundred times more acidic than we expected it to be, that was really very surprising and very acidic. Okay, okay. So so you found the baseline. So let me piece together the story if you don't mind me rephrasing. So basically starting from when you were a kid, your love of the world and your curiosity about nature led you to ask all these questions. You got into academia, you started this, which also we should uh, make note that Hubbard Brook Ecosystem Study is a big deal. Was it, it was one of the first large scale ecosystem studies, right? One of the longest running. It's one of the long, yes, that's right. It's one of the longest running. Mm -hmm. uh, we started in 1963 um, mm -hmm. to, to measure this combined uh, uh, chemistry of precipitation and stream water and lake water. There's a lake in the valley as well. And uh, so that integrated analysis is uh, one of the longest in the world, yes. Right. So you've been studying this one ecosystem in New Hampshire since 1963. And it's one of our, the things we know deepest, I guess, or, or one of the, the best we can. And so you were able to see through gathering rainwater that there was something off with the health of this ecosystem, but you didn't know how far off or what was wrong. So you got to travel all over the world <laughs> taking samples to compare and see if what you thought was correct. That, that's absolutely right. I didn't go to Amsterdam Island. Oh, I no. Have, I, I, didn't, I didn't have a month, uh, to, well, two months, one to get there and one to get back. I saw another colleague went uh, to oh. Amsterdam Island. But um, yes, that's right. Um, okay. And uh, actually, I spent a lot of time in Australia. We had a site in Northern Australia near Catherine. Yeah. And uh, so I went there several times and, and set that site up and, and had it operated. Uh, and it, uh, it, it was truly amazing. And, and, and then the other major question was, where is this acidity coming from? Yeah. And um, I, I, I met a colleague in uh, Sweden, actually. His name was Savanta Odan. And he'd been studying what he thought was the air pollution in Sweden coming from the industrial areas of the Ruhr Valley of Germany and parts of, of England. And I had a chance to meet him in 1970. And he said that uh, he, he was actually going the next day by overnight train to Oslo, Norway, and was giving a lecture. And would I like to go along? And I said, sure, I'd love to go along. So I did. So all night long on the train, he told me about his work and about his lecture. He gave his lecture in Swedish to a Norwegian audience. I didn't know either Swedish or Norwegian at that time. And, uh, but I'd heard the lecture all night before in, in English, so I knew what he was saying. And so I came 
to the idea, well, maybe that's exactly what's happening uh, with us. Maybe uh, we're getting this from long distance transport. Turns out, I'm making the story very short, uh, that's where it came from. It was coming from big electrical utilities in the Midwestern US, uh, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, where the big <coughs> electrical power plants burning uh, high sulfur coal and sometimes high sulfur oil and uh, belching out all of that sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides uh, to the atmosphere then it was being carried to the east and falling back to the land and water as acid rain and dry deposition. So that turned out to be what uh, was going on. It's much more complicated than that. We, we were faced with um, a lot of deniers, people uh, in the industry saying, oh, no, 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 not us. We didn't do it. Uh, it's, we, we didn't cause this problem. We said, yeah, you did. Yeah, you did. No, we didn't. Very much like what's going on now with climate change. Right. Um, and so we were, you know, this was a long time ago. So one of the things we did was we worked with INCAR, the National Center for um, Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, um, and used one of their very small planes and tried to fly in the plumes from some of these big stacks in the Midwest. Uh, holding a collector out the window of the what? plane. <laughs> yeah, right. Did you trying do that? To collect, trying to collect uh, uh, some of the pollutants and, and to, to verify some of the uh, uh, suspicions that we had. We also had a van on the ground that we were following along the plume and hoping that it would rain. And if it did, we would stop and rush outside with our funnels and try to catch samples of the rain. Uh, pretty primitive, but it worked. Uh, it was where it was coming from. Later on, we were able to use stable isotopes and be much more precise in terms of, of identifying what the source was. But that's where it was coming from. These large, wow. these large um, plumes from these big plants of sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide, which uh, then in the atmosphere get converted to two of our strongest acids, sulfuric acid and nitric acid, and then that's what rains down to the land and water. Okay, so <laughs> that's, no, that's great. And I'm processing, I'm gonna back you up a second. Um, so you found that it was a hundred times more acidic at Hubbard Brook. I'm still not quite sure I'm putting together, what does that do to nature there? Why is that? bad? I mean, it sounds high, it sounds acidic, but what kind of effects can it have or what have you observed? Yeah, uh, we didn't know that. And that was one of the fundamental okay. questions that we had okay. to answer and have spent decades answering not only us, but, but scientists literally all mm -hmm. over the world. Uh, a lot of scientists in, in the US and Canada and Europe, uh, and Southeast Asia, and a lot of places, scientists have been working to try to understand uh, that uh, question, what's the answer to that question? Well, uh, one of the things that, uh, uh, that was obvious early on was that it was acidifying lakes and streams, particularly lakes in sensitive areas. Uh, and by sensitive, I mean with low uh, buffering capacity in the soil, like the Adirondack Mountains of New York State. So <clears throat> those lakes, many of them were acidified. And as a result of that, they lost their, po their native population of fish, <coughs> excuse me, and, and uh, their invertebrates. The food web was disrupted, if not destroyed. And so that was some of the first uh, findings. One of the things that, that uh, the acidity in acid rain does uh, and acid rain is more than rain. It's snow, sleet, hail, and dry deposition, we generated the term acid rain. We can talk about that if you like too. Uh, mm -hmm. But at any rate, um, one of the things that it does is that it mobilizes aluminum. Aluminum in the soil in the solid phase is relatively non-toxic, but in the dissolved phase is very toxic. So it can kill tree roots, it can kill fish, it can kill invertebrates, uh, aquatic invertebrates and on and on. So we we and others learned all that. Um, and so that was one of the effects, the effects on 
uh, the, the trees. Um, uh, colleagues at the University of Vermont found that uh, acerain was able to leach calcium out of the needles of conifers mm. and that then those conifers became very sensitive to cold in, in cold winters um, and could either damage the trees or kill the trees, trees like uh, red spruce or, or um, other conifers like that. Um, uh, in some cases where the, the aluminum was uh, leached and made available in the soil solutions than the roots of trees. So uh, trees like sugar maple uh, were badly uh, harmed by, by that and would either uh, uh, decrease in their growth or, or die uh, as the case might be. Um, and so uh, these are some of the effects that uh, we, we and others learned after a lot of a long-term study. Okay, so we, so it's definitely, definitely bad. I mean, I knew it was bad. I just wanted to kind of clarify in what way or what capacity do we understand its badness? Um, yeah, it's, it's, well, let, let me, let me elaborate a little bit on that. No it's, it's, it, it caused um, damage to plants and animals then, as I mentioned, but it also caused damage to uh, structures one of the uh, early things that was uh, observed was that old gravestones in New England um, that had been put up a long time ago were badly eroded. And it turns out that acid rain was, was contributing to that erosion. So that in some cases you couldn't even read the markings on the gravestones. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that it was doing is that it's a part of the pollution complex that is associated with small particles, particles um, less than 2.5 micrometers in size. And those are the ones that get in your lungs, deep in your lungs and cause uh, health problems. So the health uh, um, effects of this kind of air pollution is also quite serious. So mm -hmm. plants, animals, structures, and uh, health. Uh, Even just them. breathing, I didn't realize the breathing part. Yeah, not the, not, not the acid rain per se, but the particles that contribute to the, mm -hmm. the acid rain. Right, right. So you said air, a moment ago- Air pollution. Yeah, yeah. And so you said a moment ago, if you wanted to expand more on all the things that count as acid rain and coining the term, um, <laughs> how did you decide on acid rain? Is it just catchy? Just well, um, uh, so we discovered it in, July of 1963, that first mm -hmm. sample that we collected, but we didn't publish our first paper until 1972, nine years later, because okay. it took us that long to, to try to understand what was going on, get some of these answers that I've been telling you about, right. um, and to, to be convinced that we, we knew what we were talking about in that first paper. So the first paper uh, that we published, uh, the three of us that are co-authors, I'm the first author, and we argued a long time what the title of the paper should be. It could have been, you know, the, the chemistry of precipitation in New England. Well, uh, not that's, not, that's not very exciting. <laughs> So I argued really strongly and won the argument with my colleagues that we would just call it acid rain. Mm -hmm. And so that was, that's the title of that paper. We didn't know that that had been used before. Uh, uh, an English scientist, uh, 1870, whatever, yeah. had uh, used the term. We didn't know that at the time, but he used it in a little different way than we were talking about. Well, it turned out that that title uh, was very important in terms of public awareness and public activity because, you know, people walk in the rain, they wash their hair in the rain, they do whatever in the rain. And here we're saying, ah, yeah, but the rain, you know, it's not good. It could do something uh, really bad. I gave a talk once at University of California, Davis in Sacramento. Sacramento is the, the public uh, hub of, of California. And I didn't know there was a reporter in the, in the audience, but the next morning, the Sacramento Bee, their main newspaper, yeah. had a big headline, 
Prof says rain on acid trip. No. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all, uh, it was a play on, on acid. Uh, Slashy. <laughs> <laughs> so so uh and then my phone rang off the hook uh, of course uh but but i think that title uh turned out to be really quite important in terms of public awareness yeah um and not from a scientific point of view but public awareness about a problem and a problem that we, the public, need to know about and then ultimately uh, do something about. And do you know, as a, a science communicator, I can't help but think that even if it was inadvertent, it was very important that you chose that name. You know, you couldn't have, you almost couldn't have crafted a more succinct um, name for the phenomenon that kind of straddled that line of accuracy and still like, like catchy, you know, still gonna understandable, right? Which is always the thing you try to balance as someone trying to communicate science to the public is like, how can they understand, but how can I stay as true as I can to what's really happening? So yeah, uh, I, I I agree totally, and and the the term was accurate, except it was more than rain, as I've I've said to you, but we mm -hmm. said that it was snow yeah. at Hubbard Brook. Uh, uh, about half the precipitation comes in as snow, uh, and the snow is just as acid, if not sometimes more acid than the rain. Uh, so uh, it, it's an accurate term, uh, and I think its catchiness uh, really helped the public to understand that there was this problem out there. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about uh, uh, the the response, the political response to uh, the problem uh, too, if you like. Let's get to that in one second before we okay. I have, no, oh, we're gonna, we've saved time for that. Uh, Cause I know that's a whole story. Um, but I kind of want to know, just kind of visit, like going back in time to, to Gene in the sixties and early seventies, somewhere in that nine years, you know, you, you did all these baseline studies, basically, you were basically science James Bond for a few years, if I may be so bold. Um, so you're flying around the world, you're testing rain everywhere, you're uh, flying in small aircraft, sticking your arm out the window, <laughs> measuring fossil fuels, you're connecting or measuring emissions, you're making connections, right? So somewhere in here, you realize kind of, you must have realized the immensity of what you were seeing. I kind of would love you just like, if you could reflect, what, what did that feel like to be kind of on the forefront of an ecological catastrophe, to kind of see that looming and know that nobody really knew it yet? It was, it was awesome. I was very young in my career, and, um, and uh, there were, as I said, a lot of deniers right. uh, that, that were, had vested interests, and so they were protecting uh, their vested interests. Uh, I'll tell you a couple stories about that. Uh, for example, um, I was, uh, by this time, I had changed jobs. I had moved from uh, Dartmouth College to Cornell University. Um, and that was a, another serendipitous event because I set up precipitation collectors around the Finger Lakes, particularly mm -hmm. Cuba and Seneca uh, lakes. And I found that the chemistry of precipitation there was almost exactly what it had been in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. So that was our very first clue that, um, that it wasn't just some unique thing at Hubbard Brook, uh, but it was uh, potentially more regional. So uh, we, wrote a paper for science, uh, uh, the journal Science. Um, and the day before that, that paper came out, uh, it was in June, I was interviewed by the New York Times and a story appeared on the front page of the New York Times about this article that was coming out in Science the next day. And that, visibility on the front page of the New York Times just blew me away because I had 
colleagues and people from literally all over the world uh, writing me and telephoning me. <laughs> we didn't have the cell phones and the internet then that we do now uh, saying, Lycans, what is going on? What is, what is all this stuff? And, and so if I was ever in doubt about how big this problem potentially was and how important it was, uh, that front page New York Times publicity uh, was enough to convince me. Um, I was I was asked by uh, an older colleague if I would be willing to um, come to Manhattan uh, and one of the, the the private clubs and have lunch with uh, one of the coal companies. He was on a board of of one of the larger coal companies in the US and to resolve our differences. And oh. I said, well, I really don't think we'll resolve our differences and I really don't want to do that. And he pushed and so finally I said, okay, I will. And, but he was at the lunch, so I have a witness to what I'm going to tell you. <laughs> at that lunch, there were two executives from the second largest coal company in the US. And at the end of the lunch, they said, we have, quote, I'll never forget this quote, quote, we have hired a whole room full of PhDs to obfuscate, confuse, and delay at every opportunity the acid rain issue, unquote. I was stunned. And I was so stunned, I said, how big is the room? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, meant, I meant how many, and then, and then I sort of collected myself and said, well, how many? And then I said, how do you sleep at night? How, how to obfuscate, confuse, and delay? How do you sleep at night? And they said, well, we don't very well, but the electric utilities require that we adopt that line, and if we don't, they won't buy our coal. So that's what we have to do to sell our coal. So. I learned a lot about politics and right. about um, power uh, and deniers, and um, I could tell you a lot of stories. Yeah, gosh, I mean, that has such obvious parallels with things that have been happening recently with the climate yes. change story. Yes. And yes. So much of that. I wonder how many PhDs are on that problem. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, I'll tell, you, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one more story quickly. Okay, go for it. Uh, and because this one, this one really, I think, is important. I mean, mm -hmm. many scientists these days, many, uh, get death threats for their uh, statements or, or positions on, on climate change. Uh, I have never received a death threat for my work on acid rain, but I did receive a threat on my career. Mm -hmm. um, one of the a power company uh, advisory groups, a very powerful group, um, put out a call for proposal. And the call for proposal said, Likens has said, and they picked out about six things that I had said in peer reviewed publications. Mm -hmm. And the call was show that he is wrong. <gasps> and they awarded $400,000. <gasps> to a consulting group to do that. And one of the things that I'm maybe most proud about in my whole career is that they weren't able to do that. That's so that wasn't, a, that wasn't a threat on my life, but it was in a sense, it was a threat on my career for sure, yeah. because I was a young professor. And if they had done that to show that, you know, my data were faulty or sloppy or, or whatever, um, then, you know, my career would probably have been over, but they weren't able to do that. Oh my gosh, that's so powerful and frightening that the power dynamics lie so much with the people, with the money and the big business. Um, but I guess that's the way the world works sometimes. We are seeing that right now with climate change. Uh, there are many examples and I won't go there right now. Yeah. Yeah. 
So, but where I would love for you to go, which you've already started, <laughs> we've already started down this road and I'd love for you to kind of continue because I know as you've hinted, it was a long, long, long process, not just of kind of proving to yourself that this was really happening and that you understood the cause enough to make a paper about it. But also you then had to kind of spread the word and get it out, not just in policy, but to the public. Can you tell us some of that story? Um, I would love it. It, it. It's a very long story because it literally started in 1960, July, 1963. Yeah. Well, one of the, the, I'll try to hit a few key points. One of them was in uh, September of 1983, I was asked by William Ruckelshaus, the administrator of EPA, to lead a small uh, group of scientists to the White House to brief President Reagan and the full cabinet on the issue of acid rain. And we did that. Um, I don't know that that had been done before, certainly not in that way. Um, we had a full hour with them. We explained what the problem was. We explained how it could be uh, addressed. And um, at the end of uh, that hour, I was the last one to speak and I was standing uh, fairly close to President Reagan, and he leaned back in his chair, and another quote I will never forget said, well, gentlemen, and there were women there, well, gentlemen, it's clear to me that my undergraduate education did not prepare me for such complicated issues, unquote. I thought, no. Good grief. <laughs> Again, I'm not very quick in my response. I thought, good grief. And then I thought to myself, and I didn't ask him, I wonder where he went to undergraduate school. <laughs> Write them a letter. <laughs> yeah, I, I know where he went, but I didn't. At any rate, so um, he and his administration chose not to uh, deal with acid rain, mm -hmm. but to study it for 10 years. They started a program called the National Acid Precipitation Assessment Program, NAPAP, NAPAP, uh, and, and did that. Um, and then uh, he, he was succeeded by George Bush, the senior George H. Bush, who one of the first things he said publicly was, we're going to deal with this acid rain problem. It's gone on long enough. We have to deal with it. I don't know why he, why he said that, but that's what he said. His uh, um, uh, EPA administrator said the same thing. The Secretary of State said the same thing. And so they began to do that. So they uh, uh, moved it along such that the Congress, both the House and the Senate, not unanimously, but almost unanimously, approved of the, uh, what was then the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, which was focused on reducing specifically acid rain. Um, and Bush started to get a little cold feet about signing it into law. And one of the big environmental uh, uh, groups, the Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, came up with the idea of cap and trade that you could cap the pollution and then trade it. So if you mm -hmm. had a dirty plant, you could trade it with a clean plant's emissions and actually make money off of those, those trades. Um, and then he signed it into law. So in November of 1990, the Clean Air Act amendments were signed into law. So that was 27 years between discovery and political action, 27 years. Um, so I often say, well, it took three presidents because Jimmy Carter had been involved and then Ronald Reagan and then George H. Bush, three presidents and one Pope because uh, John Paul II had hosted a meeting at the Vatican that I attended for a week long. We talked about acid brain and then gave a report uh, to the Pope. Uh, he listened carefully and then issued an encyclical. And probably that encyclical had as much or more impact politically than anything. Um, and so it took three presidents, one Pope, 
and 27 years uh, to deal with the acid rain problem. So that's a very shortened version of a long story. I know, you, should, you need to write a memoir. I would read that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have written- 26 some, books, yeah, I know yeah. I read that. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah. Well, I also have. I should hold this up too. The oh, Hubbard yes. story is all in this book, uh, the story of a forest ecosystem. Um, so, if you want to learn more about that, there's a whole book on that. Um, so, 27 years, and meanwhile, parallel with this kind of political push and the effort to get it into policy, what was going on, kind of in the media and in the public's understanding? At one point, they thought it was acid that was in the rain, like the the drug acid that was in the rain, like LSD. And how hard was it? I know you shared with me before what a challenge it is to kind of get folks to understand the pH scale. You know, if they're not fresh on their biology or their chemistry, how hard was it? And what was the the public doing during these twenty seven years? It was very hard, but on the other hand, the media latched onto the problem, maybe again, partly because of the, of the title and what everybody was talking about, the shorthand acid rain. Right. Um, and, and there were, um, and there's been a couple papers on what I'm gonna say, um, published papers. Um, there were lots of cartoons. There were, you know, people standing with an umbrella that was all uh, dissolved away, presumably by acid rain. But there were lots of cartoons. And one of my favorites is uh, a cartoon of a guy with a, a giant fish, but there's nothing left but the skeleton. And he's saying to somebody standing there, acid rain got to it before I could. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that isn't right. The acid was never strong enough to dissolve away the meat on a fish. And if it was going to dissolve away anything, it would dissolve away the bones, not the meat, uh, if it could get to the bones. And, and so it was a little white lie. But the image of that fish skeleton and the fisherman had real impact. And I believe, and these articles support that belief, that those... Um, Cartoons were very influential in public opinion. Um, and, and so when George H. Bush came into office, I think that's what led one of the things, not the thing, one of the things that led him to say, we're going to deal with this problem. It's mm -hmm. gone on long enough. Uh, uh, another thing I think was, we presented a lot of our data in maps. We worked really hard to scrounge all the information we could to put together maps. So we have a map showing in the Eastern United States in 1975, the distribution of acid rain, and then one for 1985, it's bigger and more intense, and one for 95. And I think the public can understand that much better than a graph per se. I think they have trouble often with graphs, right. but you see that you know the the the, the space is bigger <laughs> and it's yeah. it's more intense. And I think that communicates uh, with the public uh, in ways that uh, we're having trouble with with climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think some of those things um, were very important. Uh, in terms of making uh, a policy decision. I think maybe one of the other things was acid rain was impacting the Eastern states, particularly New England and Eastern Canada. So the Eastern political establishment could say, ah, oh, you guys in the Midwest, you're doing this, you gotta stop, you're, you're killing our fish, you're killing our lakes, you're killing our forests. And, um, uh, and I think that was another factor. Uh, thank um, you for someone else. One thing I want to be sure I don't forget to mention is mm -hmm. that with the Clean Air Acts of 1970 and then the 1991 focus specifically on acid rain, the acidity of rain now in at Hubbard Brook and in the eastern United States is about 80% less than it was in 1970 when it was at its peak. 
So that's a huge success story. We don't have a lot of success stories like that. That's a huge one. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have cleaned the environment in terms of air pollution in that regard. Very proud of that. But at the same time, all that acidity for all those years has leached out a lot of the buffering capacity in the soil. It's like having Tums and roll aids in your stomach. When the acidity uses mm. them up, then you have another stomach ache. Well, we've leached out a lot of the buffering capacity in the soil by years and years of acid rain. So if we were to go back with more emissions, as the Trump administration was proposing uh, just a few years ago, that could have really large consequences. So, so it's, it's a success story, but it's still there because of the legacy of what it has done to soils. So if I can rephrase quickly, what I think I understand you're saying is that soils, the way they were, had the ability to kind of neutralize the acidity in the rain and make it not as harmful. But now it's been used up because the Tums has been melted away. Right. And so if the same sort of same level of acidity were encountered or or less because or less. oh even less because there's less capability right. to neutralize it the, the soils are more sensitive that's important thank you for sharing that um and thank you i like the the story of how even though the danger was almost exaggerated in a way that steered away from accuracy to the public that's what made things change um that actually reminded me a lot of, of today and the, the effectiveness of memes on the internet. I feel like in many ways, particularly with younger people, internet memes are doing the same thing as the editorial cartoons, just poking fun and exaggerating things in a way that's getting a message across. I feel like I'm sure people are writing dissertations on this, but I would love to read that. <laughs> so. Well, uh, I, I, you know, I talk about this and, and um, and ask the question, is it okay to tell little white lies if the end justifies the mean? I think that's a really profound question yeah. and one we need to always think about. I actually took an ethics class with you back in like <laughs> right. 20, 2011, 2011 or something. And I yeah. remember asking that question because I was like, oh no. <laughs> so, so the question is very real and very important. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much for sharing that story. Uh, I have one more question for you to think about and then I'm gonna turn to the questions from the folks watching. So if anyone has questions, <coughs> we have another chance. Take a look in the Q&A, see if anyone would ask your question or add your own. Um, and Jean, kind of, I'd like to ask you one final thing, which is along this whole story, what really led you into science was your curiosity about the world. And then your curiosity to, to figure out why something wasn't the way you expected it and just the way you define natural history, right? So natural history in many ways seems to have kind of led you to asking these questions and becoming a scientist and and working so hard to, to fight for our clean air and our clean water. Um, however, I also know as a scientist, natural history is often looked down on by science and it's thought of as just too simplistic or not relative. I've heard it called the unfashionable science. I really like that one. Um, can you speak to this perception? Yeah, I, d I don't agree with that. I think, um maybe we've gotten away from some of our roots uh, in that regard, particularly in biology and particularly in ecology, where um, we need to know what's there um, and what it's doing uh, as a baseline. Uh, I, most of my career, I've, I've worked with uh, doing experiments, large scale experiments. Um, and I have to know what's there before I can even begin to think about applying an experimental approach to a, a question that I have. So uh, for me, natural history is, is a critical component of setting the stage for what I really want uh, to, to do maybe uh, at, at a 
a more sophisticated level, I, but I don't call uh, natural history unsophisticated, as you as you said. But I think uh, it's it's vital to 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 know what's there and to uh, have some idea of, of what they do. Um, do I have time for another quick story? Yeah, uh, to go for it. This is your show. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I used to teach it at Cornell, as I said, and. And one of the things I did, uh, I taught a course on limnology, which is the study of inland waters. And I would always take the class to a very unusual lake near Syracuse uh, called Green Lake. Uh, it's a miramictic lake, meaning that it never circulates completely from top to bottom. And oh, it's okay. a very unusual kind of lake. Uh, I won't go into why it's like that. But I would love to take the students there and we'd all go out on boats in the lake. And I would say to the students, okay, now we're gonna collect a sample from 18 meters down. That's pretty deep. It's about halfway down in, in Green Lake. Um, and uh, that's so, and we had a clear water bottle. So we'd collect a sample from 18 meters and we'd bring it up. So they'd, they'd lower it down and they'd send down the messenger and we'd collect a sample and bring it up and pull it out of the surface and it was pink, it was pink. And they would just go crazy. Why is this pink? Where, where did it get to be pink? Well, it was from um, uh, the, the, the bacteria that were growing at that level in the lake. Uh, the purple sulfur bacteria were using the sulfide in the deeper water and the, uh, the anaerobic, uh, no oxygen in the deeper water. And they had accumulated such a layer that they were pink. Well, that sense of discovery, that's really natural history because that's a part of the structure of that lake. Yeah. But the, the sense of discovery of, oh, wow, look at that. Yeah. That has always just turned me on in biology. So oh, I love that. And by the same token, I think like that same discovery and like curiosity, that's the thing that makes natural history more accessible to everyone. You know, you don't have to be a scientist to feel that awe about the world. And I think that's cool. <laughs> so fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Let me turn to some questions from our audience at home now and see. Um, so this is from Richard Feldman. Feldman. Um, relative to the wisdom of choosing acid rain as the descriptor, Dr. Likens once told a group of us who were grad students at Binghamton that he always strove to explain his work in a way that his mother could relate to. <laughs> oh, that's great. I love that. Thank you. Th thank you for remembering that. And that's one of the bits of advice I usually give graduate students. Explain it so people can understand it. Otherwise, you're wasting their time and your time. And so I, my mother was not a scientist, but she was an intelligent woman. And I've always said, yeah, I wanted to, the work I've done, I've always wanted to be able to say it to her so that she could understand it. Thank you for remembering that story. That's a good one. <laughs> um, here's a question from someone watching on YouTube. Um, how did the public respond to your findings about acid rain? And how important do you think it is for scientists to engage with policymakers? Well, uh, there were, as I said several times, there were lots of deniers and there were lots of, uh, of pushbacks. Uh, there were lots of times I was maybe giving a lecture, a, a formal lecture, maybe at a university or wherever, and somebody would stand up rudely and not even hold up their hand, just stand up rudely and said, I don't believe there is anything like acid rain. And uh, mm -hmm. so what are you going to do? I'd usually say, well, did you ever collect a sample of rain and measure its acidity? And they'd usually say, no. I said, we'll try it sometime. And then they'd sit down. But, but yeah, no, it was, it was difficult. Uh, I don't think quite as difficult as what's going on now with climate change and the death threats and all that, but it was difficult, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that actually segues to another question. Stan asks, what parallels do you see between acid rain and climate change? Yeah, well, they both have the same root cause, the, the combustion of fossil fuels, coal and oil. Uh, they do operate very different biogeochemically. <laughs> so the, the sulfur dioxide uh, gets, gets formed in the combustion of high sulfur coal or oil. 
goes up in the atmosphere and then comes back down. That's why the cap and trade will work because you can actually trade between a dirty and a clean. Whereas carbon dioxide goes up in the atmosphere and then circulates around the entire globe. So it's much more difficult to trade dirty and clean uh, and have a cap and trade program. So uh, there's a scientific reason why that, that is the case. The, the, those two gases work differently. Thank you so much. Um, this is a, a really fun question from Barbara Brown. Uh, and maybe we don't know this answer, but I think it's cool to think about. Um, has the large fungal network found in the forest that allow trees to trade nutrients been affected by acid rain in reference to Suzanne Samard's work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Yeah. Uh, I really don't. I, 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 I haven't studied it and I haven't really ever read anything about it. My guess is, if I were going to guess, yeah, probably has affected it in some way, but I don't know the answer. Sorry. No, that's okay. That's something that we still need studies done on. I guess maybe someone knows the answer. Oh yeah, right. So Reed would like to know. Well, what what we, well sorry, Jesse. Nope. What would we scientists have to do if there weren't questions that we didn't know the <laughs> answers to? I know. I love that. When I used to teach middle school, I kids would always ask a question. I'd be like, oh, no one knows that yet. I guess that's your job to figure out. So <laughs> have fun. Um, Reed Harley wants to know, what is the best energy type, solar, wind, water, for maintaining a clean water and air and ecosystems? Uh, that's a toughie, too, because of... Um, Only the actually been I teach this course at UConn currently, Nature Science and Society, it's called. And we've actually been thinking about and talking about that. And I don't think there's a good answer. Um, mm -hmm because it depends upon, <laughs> scientists are always blamed for saying, well, on the one hand, it might be this, and on the other hand, it might be this. And I once had a politician tell me, I want to meet a scientist only one-handed. I don't like this on the one hand, this, and the other hand, that. At any rate, it does depend upon um, your sources of, of, you know, do you have a large open space with a lot of wind? Do you have a large open space with a lot of sun and few clouds? So it depends upon a lot of different factors. Uh, uh, I think smart people are working on that, trying to install uh, arrays of, of uh, wind and solar and water uh, using wave action and tidal action. Um, but uh, I think it depends, sorry. No, that's... that's that's like well, such a science I, answer, right? Like, it's hard to say, it depends. Yeah. So several people ask uh, questions about uh, the impact of acid rain on various things. And so I'll just kind of give them all to you and then you can kind of share what you know. <coughs> How relevant is acid rain kind of uh, in Arizona in the Western world? Cause you mentioned it affecting the Eastern United States. How has it affected ocean ecosystems? Does it hurt, hurt any organisms in particular? Um, just generally how relevant is it today as well? Yeah. Um, so on, on the more calcareous soils of, of the West, like Arizona, uh, it's not going to have much of an impact on those soils. I mentioned the Adirondack Mountains in New York State, where the soils are, are nutrient poor and have low buffering capacity. And that's where it has, they're more sensitive and that's where it has more effect. Um, I'm glad you raised the question about the ocean because there's a big confusion factor there. Acid rain is not acidifying the ocean. Carbon dioxide is. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about acidification at a pH of maybe 7.2 to 7.4 or, or whatever, depending upon what the pH is at, at the ocean that you're considering. So the, the two different... Uh, the phenomenon of acidification is the same, but the acids are different. And, and acid rain is a sulfuric and nitric. Uh, and yeah, they fall in the ocean. And yeah, they have a small effect, but it's the carbon dioxide being dissolved in the ocean that's changing. And the pHs are, are high. They're in the, in the sevens, uh, whereas I'm talking about pHs in the fours, threes, and even mm -hmm. twos. But we measured values uh, in the twos uh, over the years at Hubbard Brook. Does that help? Because that, that's always a point of confusion. I think so. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, 
So I think we're about at the end. Uh, were you indeed, is it true that you were one of the founders of what was the New York Natural History Conference and now is the Northeast Natural History Conference? Is that true? I was one of the early attendees. I don't know mm. if I call myself a founder. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Fantastic. Oh, one more. Um, and then we'll wrap this up to those of you. So last question. Um, in the 1970s and 80s, German forests experienced acid rain. A group of soil scientists uh, started acid rain research programs uh, in the forest. And this person was wondering if you visited the experimental forest and had any collaborations with the researchers there. Yeah, one of the principal scientists was named Ulrich. Um, and um, yes, I have visited that area. I didn't work with them uh, other than visiting and, and consultation and talking and things of that sort. Um, but uh, they were some of the first to, to uh, suggest that uh, aluminum might be an important factor uh, in terms of forest health, and, mm -hmm. and it is. Uh, they, they, there was a lot of pushback on their early work as uh, being not correct or not relevant or not whatever, uh, but uh, a lot of it was right on. Uh, and that early work uh, with soil chemistry was very important, I think. Great. Oh, wait, one more popped in. How large of an area does acid rain impact in a place? I don't quite understand the question, but uh, in, the, in North America, it, it impacted essentially um, east of the Mississippi River um, and in Canada, uh, there were sources that were impacting Eastern Canada as well. Um, and currently, uh, there are big areas of Southeast Asia uh, where uh, acid rain is an emerging problem. There have been several papers written recently about uh, what's going on there. Um, and so uh, it's not gone away globally. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is actually the last question and then I'm going to sign off. So thank you everyone for, for bearing with me. Um, how did Europe respond politically and legally to the growing evidence of acid rain in the region? I just think that one's relevant. Yeah, they, they, they fought response for a long time. Uh, this uh, scientist I mentioned earlier. Uh, 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 Ulrich, you said? No. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> No, the Swedish Savant uh, oh, mm -hmm. Savant Odin, O D E N, um, with a hyphen in it. Um, he was he was pushing very hard, um, uh, and then finally uh, Europe came around and and actually developed large models for emissions for um, um, Western Europe. Uh, better than better than we had in the beginning by far we in, in Canada and the US uh, but these were large models that on a daily basis they would calculate uh, what the emissions were likely to be what the winds were likely to be and then they would adjust uh, the burning rates and the emissions and whatnot to try to deal with all that to reduce the impact so um, they they came around but they were more slow uh, to do so more slow even than us? That, that's impossible. <laughs> yeah, they were. They, they were. Uh, wow. the, the, the Swedes, the Norwegians, and the Finns were pushing very hard because yeah. they have many lakes, and many of the lakes are, are um, uh, poorly buffered. And so they were seeing impacts from the air pollution uh, early on, and they didn't like it. And so mm -hmm. they were, I, I spent many wonderful uh, <laughs> Uh, times visiting those uh, countries and, and talking with them about uh, what could and should be done. So, uh, but, but particularly uh, Sweden, Norway, and Finland uh, were pushing the rest of Europe. Thank you, Jean. Um, and before I kind of wrap us up, is there anything I forgot to ask you that I should have asked you or something, anything you'd like to say before we, before I wrap up? Um, no, other than thank you again for inviting me. I'm, I'm pleased and honored to, to be invited. Um, and I think um, we have so few success stories in the environmental area. You can think of some DDT, tobacco, uh, 
um, maybe eutrophication of fresh waters, but there's so few uh, that the acid rain one stands out as, as a real success story. Yeah. Not because of me. I don't mean that, but I mean- But also of, because of you. I know you won't say that, but also because of you. And well, thank you. The, yeah. the, politi the political action, that, that, that's right. what finally did it. I'm not, a, I'm not a politician. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, thank you for adding that. Um, and for everyone, thank you all for being here. I think we're just about out of time. Gina, it's been so great talking. Thank you again for spending this time with us on a Wednesday evening. Um, and thank you for everything you've done. I know you say it was the policy and it was, but none of the policy would have happened if you hadn't been there to do the research and show them the way. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, and thank you all of you for joining us. Again, I wanted to mention NHI's website. You can support our work there if you so choose. It's naturalhistoryinstitute.org. Our YouTube channel is a wonderful resource. Uh, this presentation will be there in edited form tomorrow, where I'll just trim off the beginning. Um, and stay tuned for our next webinar in this series. It's coming up on December 14th. It's The Secrets of Sunflowers and Natural History of Sunflowers featuring Dr. Nora Mitchell. Wednesday, December 14th, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 6 p.m. Arizona. Um, so with that, thank you, Jean. Thank you again, everyone, so much for joining us. Uh, and it was great to be with you this evening.